Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome, all. Uh, my name is Saurabh Arora. I am a lecturer at SPRU, Science Policy Research Unit, together SPRU with CIED, Center for International Education, and IDS, and Global Studies. We organize this wonderful series of lectures called the Sussex Development Lectures. And the theme, as many of you know, for this term's uh, SDL, Sussex Development Lectures, is Decolonizing Development. And today is the last lecture for this year, for this term, by Olivia Rodazipa. So please uh, join me in giving a very warm welcome <laughs> to our speaker. <laughs> Olivia is a senior lecturer at University of Portsmouth uh, in European and International Development Studies. She has a PhD from University of Kent, as well as the European University Institute in Florence in international relations and political sciences. She has also worked as a journalist for a few years, I gather, in Brussels. And she does, still does some, some of that. So she's a multifaceted personality <laughs> sitting here. And in the last 15 years, Olivia's research has focused on European ethical policy in the global south, uh, as well as decolonial international solidarity between different movements in Africa and the USA some of which I'm sure she will talk about now. Um, so as we were just discussing, the boring introduction <laughs> is finished. The interesting part begins. <laughs> Olivia. Thank you very much. Is the microphone working? Sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, first and foremost, I really wanted to um, express how happy and grateful I am to be invited to this lecture series. Um, and that has a lot to do, apart from the fact that I always like to come to Sussex, but uh, also to do with, with the theme, obviously, uh, and the, I think, courageous theme of decolonizing development, because it's a topic that is close to both my personal and professional heart, uh, let's say. I'm a um, second-generation Rwandan researcher, uh, born and bred in Belgium, and um, as was mentioned before, I'm to start with mostly an IR scholar, or that's how I would describe myself. But whenever you decide to study something to do with the Global South, you often really easily end up in development studies, right? So I ended up teaching that. Um, so like I said, both from personal and professional perspective, it's a topic that I, I find really, uh, really important. But it's also an issue that I consider as um, highly timely, I think, in our current times. And that involves both the local and the global. Whether we can separate that, it's another question. <clears throat> I would say that on the one hand, these times of ours showcase both profound mm -hmm. and sustained attempts um, at disrupting the colonial status quo. We see um, that previous understandings of what passes as knowledge or ethical behavior and often they have been defined quite narrowly, hegemonically, um, and often projected as universal, are being questioned and fought against. Just in university circles already, one could think of, different, of the different hashtag movements, uh, from why is my curriculum wide, to roads must fall, or fees must fall in South Africa. At the same time, these moves have not developed in academic isolation, luckily, and I also think that's why they might be uh, so exciting and life-affirming. But to a large extent, they have been inspired by and are developing hand-in-hand -hand with similar demands for radical changes by varied groups and movements in our societies at large. I'm thinking of the BDS movements against the continued apartheid system and colonization of Palestine and its people, Occupy movements, so-called Arab Springs, the uh, North Dakota Access Pipeline Protectors Movement, Black Lives Matters, the Women's Marches in January last year. This clearly partial and unfinished list showcases immediately the multidirectional and multi-issue nature of what is being challenged. At the same time, one can trace all these protests as linked to a desire to undo and heal the breaches, fractures, dismemberings of a colonial system that seems not to have had the rupture that was believed to have happened in the 60s with the takedown of the official forms of political colonization. So more or less, this is where I would situate the need for decolonization today um, in our current times. So of the same current times, on the other hand, we see, because this was maybe um, the more optimistic and, again, um, very encouraging movements that we see around us, 
there's also the other ones. On the other hand, we see our times as being marked by frantic and violent attempts to hold on to the colonial status quo. This status quo I see as racist, extractive, patriarchal, heteronormative, secular colonialities in particular. And for the untrained eye, they might seem expressions of the rise of extremism or exceptionalities, yet I think it might be more productive to see them as continuities of a colonial past into the present that seek to stay meaningful and are being forcefully reaffirmed and rearticulated in response to this, what I call optimistic anti-colonial pushbacks. We see a renewed vigor <clears throat> to protect this white man's world from alt-right movements in the US that have penetrated the highest offices of government, as well as anti-immigrant sentiments and voting behavior that we see in continental Europe and the UK alike today. So it's against this duo, mutually constitutive background, that I want to paint my reflections on decolonizing development this evening, and in particular, decolonizing international development studies. The reason is that because in its most generous reading, um, and you will probably see that my reading of development aid is not always uh, very generous in general, but in its most uh, generous reading, I would say that development aid and studies are even in the context of these realities imbued by coloniality, still the site where ideas and intentions of solidarity and concerns for the others well-being are being expressed, and not just expressed, but also institutionalized. When I look at my students, for instance, every year when they uh, start uh, the course with me and I teach in international development studies, the question that I do ask them is, how did you end up in my classroom? Why did you choose uh, this degree? And invariably, it's always um, answers that have something to do with, I want to be meaningful in the world, I want to help. So I think mm. in my generous reading, this is uh, what I would still like to capture, even though I might advocate for the complete uh, tearing down of uh, the idea of development studies. <clears throat> uh, at the same time, though, an anti-colonial reading of this aid and development sector or studies practices would locate its actions and thinking firmly into this continuation of coloniality that it is supposed to tackle. The coloniality that created the ills of poverty, conflict, deprivation, diseases, environmental degradation, exploitation in the first place. So again, it's this tension of it being a location of where the best um, intentions and idea of solidarity are institutionalized, but on the other hand, as an institution that somehow it is uh, complicit in the continuation <coughs> of coloniality. So it's here that I um, um, locate uh, the call to decolonize uh, development, because it's also here that we are straight away confronted with the question of either its possibility or even impossibility. Because if development is a continuation of a colonial mindset of inferiority and superiority as the gift of progress by the superior societies to the others, should it be salvaged at all? And whose interests are being served by trying to do this in the first place? What do we keep? What do we get rid of? It's from these reflections that um, I somehow cobbled my title together, the title being on babies and bathwater. So in what follows, I will argue these two main points. First of all, that development as a system of ideologies, studies, institutions, and practices is the bathwater. As such, I think we need to find ways to go beyond critiquing and deconstructing it, and I would even advocate to get rid of it. And obviously, um, I would like to think through what that actually might mean and the implications uh, together with you. I will argue that um, we need to fight the desire to hold on to development studies, to find the strength to cut the so-called umbilical cord, to stay in the metaphor, <laughs> with this discipline that might well have given us our professional and personal identities, standing in society, even our paychecks. Again, it might sound quite cynical, but somehow to try and think where maybe some of our attachments are uh, located. So that was for the bad water. Secondly, I will argue that the baby in this story um, are the ideas, desires, and energy we're keeping and fighting for are those that pertain global justice, solidarity, reparations, 
as in righting the past and present wrongs. So it's within that tension that I would like to think about um, decolonizing international development studies. The title might sound flashy, I might have an idea of what I want to say, but unfortunately I do not have unitary or even solid answers to how to decolonize development. <clears throat> You will see that the second part of my talk will sound much more unfinished. It's much more ideas that I'm still uh, thinking about. Because mainly what I often end up with is with more questions um, than answers. And I console myself with the idea that from a decolonial perspective, we might also need to fight the idea that we need to reproduce uh, this one-size-fits-all solutions for all the problems all at the same time, in the same way for everyone on this planet. I know, it's not, it's not a great excuse, but it fits somewhere in there. <laughs> but what I will offer instead um, is a framework of reflection, a strategic framework, actually, based on um, decolonial insights, also insights from other critical schools, for both deconstructive and reconstructive strategies um, to address the implications of the decolonial invitation, option, or imperative, even. And obviously the invitation is that you can uh, somehow fill it in, accept, reject, adapt it to your own positionality, uh, your own focus of work. This decolonial strategic framework um, will touch upon three levels. And I divide it in three for analytical purpose, not because they can actually be split in... Um, actually be split or are observable as separately in uh, reality. And the three that I will touch upon are issues related to ontology, epistemology, and normativity. And the normativity somehow stresses the need um, to be very mindful to actively not separate discussions on representation or the immaterial from materiality. <coughs> This gigantic ta task of decolonizing international development is something that cannot be thought of in the abstract. It is both inspired by um, and needs to be tailored to concrete context of international development teaching, research, and practices. And this means that the priorities and imperatives in a European context might be very different from those questions of decolonization and decolonizing development, for instance, on the African continent. But even in more detail, um, there are differences between continental Europe, for instance, I myself hail from Belgium, or uh, the UK. In Belgium, for instance, post-colonial thought for a long time, and it's slowly by slowly changing, luckily, uh, is often still either absent or timidly emerging as a critical disciplinary lens. In the UK, on the other hand, uh, when I first came here, the thing that, that uh, struck me was that there seems to be an understanding that postcolonialism or decolonial, most po mostly postcolonialism, has been engaged with already, and now it's time to move on to the next. <laughs> I think that's uh, a false understanding of what's going on, but um, I put it here slightly in a simplified way, the purpose being that those comparative analyses might be instrumental in working towards both a more comprehensive but also a more tailor-made understanding of the challenges at hand, all the while not forgetting to retranslate them to their specific context. All of that to say that I won't be claiming to produce absolute truth here. It's very uh, situated and contextualized uh, knowledge. So my talk will therefore address specifically contemporary Western European understandings and practices of development and how they have been shaped over time as I said, decolonizing development discussions in other settings within previously colonized spaces and countries, for instance, might well come up with a whole different set or ranking of priorities, and I think that should be okay. Here, I will concentrate on, the specific, on a specific us of development educators, researchers, knowledge producers, and other practitioners, those located in the global north. Again, this unitary category obviously does not exist literally in the world out there, and there's so many variations uh, within them. Um, I think of my own diaspora positionality that might inform me in different ways than some of my colleagues, um, and vice versa. Here, it serves the purpose of addressing a comparatively 
a relatively hegemonic positionality in the analysis of colonial power embedded in international development thinking. And I will have a particular focus on the academic uh, context. So while expanding on this, the triple decolonial lens, ontology, epistemology, and uh, normativity of the strategic framework, I will also try to think uh, systematically through the implications, time permitting, and again at three levels. So somehow to try uh, and give some examples when it comes to pedagogy, the university as an institution, and that of research and us as researchers, but mostly pertaining to the research agenda uh, in general. So in all of this, I obviously look first and foremost forward to your own contributions and questions and comments on this. So that was it for the most uh, organized part of the talk. <laughs> now we'll move on to the more unfinished, or let's say the spontaneous uh, one. So um, a threefold decolonial strategic uh, framework. I've been working around it and thinking about it uh, for a while. The strategic approach is something that um, I uh, was inspired by the work of Mira Sabaratnam, for instance, um, who tried to somehow make a translation of decolonial thinking um, as it's out there in our different disciplines and how we can apply it in uh, IR uh, thinking. Um, and so while I was thinking about this framework, a couple of years ago there was um, a postdoctoral or a doctoral uh, workshop in Helsinki in Finland, and the theme was um, post-development studies and trying to think what, what has happened, what have we done, where are we now? And um, a question came up that I, I found really uh, important and it keeps me thinking, and I think it really ties into um, the theme of, of this lecture series. The question was, how come if for let's say four decades now, we've had all these brilliant insights from the post-development uh, thinking. How come we still have the international aid and development sector? How come not that much has changed in terms of how we organize aid and everything? And I think that was a very important and brave question also because some of really the, the, um, the forefathers, the big thinkers of this post-colonial, uh, post-development thinking like Arturo Escobar, they were there. So everybody was around the table thinking, we've done the deconstruction, all the critiques are there, they're quite solid, obviously you can be in favor or against, but it seems that in the world out there, the aid industry is still alive and kicking. And so one of the answers that, that I was thinking about at that moment, and it's probably the first time that I started thinking, why do we still have international development departments uh, or degrees in and of itself, was this idea that um, as long as we institutionally, for instance, keep offering international development studies as a career path that intertwines students' financial and personal investments, but the same goes for us as educators, obviously, to somehow try to understand that it might be very unlikely, however critically we engage with the issues pedagogically in class, that the system will magically dissolve if we do not address the organizational, institutional architecture of development. So what I'm trying to say here is that I think that there is scope to connect the critical scholarly insights that have been developed over the years. So it's not about reinventing the wheel. In critical studies, dependency, world system theories, feminist approaches, post and decolonial thinking, post development thinking, obviously and how they are timidly entering and altering what we teach, um, hopefully, we need to reconnect those with how our institutional setup of both research and education uh, is unfolding at the moment. So the decolonial strategic framework that I develop here is an attempt to bring together all these different insights. There will be a lot of generalizations um, glossing over, but I think you will uh, get the drift. Um, and to tie them simultaneously to the different layers of development studies, the classroom, research agendas, and the institutional environments in which they take place. <clears throat> 
drawing such a decolonial strategic framework is not necessarily an attempt to box decolonial thinking into a unitary mode of thinking again, as theories uh, often uh, supposed to do or tend to do, and decoloniality um, claims not to want to be a theory. But while acknowledging its contextual nature and ever-changing features to make the insights workable, applicable, to all aspects of research and pedagogy uh, we are confronted with when trying to decolonize our social worlds. So what are these three um, strategies? The first one pertains ontology, uh, like I said. Ontology in its most simplistic way would be how do we understand the world? How, what, what do we understand it uh, to be? So it addresses somehow the what question. Um, the decolonial uh, imperative there, or invitation, would somehow be um, that it points at a need to demythologize. So a lot of what we, cl what we cling to, what we understand the world to be, is mythological. And I will come back at some point at the fact that there's nothing wrong with mythologies in and of themselves. But uh, within the current um, system of knowledge, uh, myths don't uh, have a lot of standing or power, right? So the first one, how do we see the world? And um, decoloniality would call for a need to demythologize. The second strategy uh, pertains epistemology and is about um, how do we learn about what we know? How do we learn about this world? And that's uh, the how question. So how do we come at what we know? And how can this mythological understanding of the world persist? in spite of different attempts at deconstruction, critiquing of what we uh, already know. And linked to that question is who gets to speak, who gets to be considered as expert, most importantly, who systematically not. Um, and obviously this question of epistemology is not detached from ontology, um, but like I said, for analytical reasons, I split them up here. Decoloniality here would call for the need to desilence. Again, silencing, desilencing is not something uh, I came up with myself. It's very much a part of uh, post and decolonial thinking already. And the third strategy points um, at the question of why we produce knowledge in the first place, to serve what purpose, and it pertains normativity. So why are we producing the knowledge that we are producing? Does it serve the colonial status quo? Does it serve moving towards radical uh, alternatives. So it's about explicitly re-embracing the impossibility of object, objective knowledge production. And here, one could say that decoloniality calls for knowledge production explicitly at the service of both material and immaterial decolonization. Okay, so those are the three. Let me have a look at the time. Still doing it, okay. So, um, when it comes, if I go back to the first strategy that addresses uh, ontology and the need to demythologize, the main mythological element, let's say, of development thinking, I would say is the idea that the betterment of peoples, often peoples elsewhere or other people even close by, cannot be thought of outside of a Western presence. Um, and I'm sure that there are other uh, myths as well, but let's say specifically to when it comes to uh, development thinking, I think this is a, a, very, a very important one that is not always that explicit, but if we think of most of the things that we teach, um, maybe also most of the things that we research and we locate ourselves in that, it's very difficult to find a space outside a Western presence in that, whether it's an epistemological presence or a physical presence or... Um, and so one could ask how come that this mythological understanding of this reality in which solidarity should take place uh, is being uh, sustained at the same time when we're producing all these critical approaches um, um, very sustainably, very successfully for many decades now, and how uh, is this being perpetuated even in the critical spaces? So there again... Um, and yeah, we often like to think in terms of three points, but it always helps to <laughs> somehow make sense of all these different things we could talk about. But in terms of ontology, I think three points are helpful also to keep in mind. And again, they're very general, but I think they can be applied to many different uh, areas of studies. 
The first one would be trying to think of where do we locate our point of origin in whatever we teach, whatever we do, whatever we discuss. Second pertains the problem of fragmentation. And the third one, uh, one of Eurocentrism. And all of them somehow um, link to a, mytholo a mythological understanding of the world and how it can be reproduced. So the point of origin obviously speaks to where do we start uh, the story. And I think especially in development studies, this is a very important uh, question. Sometimes very literally, where do you start your course? How do you introduce to your first year students what development is about? And for a long time, probably also how it was taught uh, to me, but also in many of the syllabus that we have, we will see that it is often very much framed in this post First, Second World War uh, optimistic initiatives that give rise to the study of development, right? We, we even name an inaugural speech of one or the other American president to somehow point that as a point of origin of development. So what I've started to do now is actually to start my, um, my courses by making students either watch um, the documentary Concerning Violence, for instance, um, where it's a text by um, France Fanon that is being narrated by Lauren Hill and that uses um, images of the decolonization processes in the 70s and the 80s uh, in Africa. Um, and my third years, we start by reading Aimé Césaire's Discourses on uh, Colonialism. And what that does, again, is not necessarily that we need to proclaim a new absolute point of departure, but somehow by already questioning what the points of depart departure or points of origin are that we continuously reproduce, is that if you start the story about the need for development at the moment that the Western world woke up and said, let's be nice to other people in a complete historical vacuum, it has a lot of implications uh, and it's completely different than if you start the story from um, transatlantic enslavement and colonization, somehow to give from the get-go an idea that this situation of extreme inequality between global north and global south did not fall out of the sky, right? But also it somehow implicates us as Western actors in that story from the beginning, and it's much more difficult to keep on presenting us as only the firefighters and not the pyromaniacs or the arsonists in uh, the story. And, and so that point about firefighters, pyromaniac, um, somehow speaks to the problem of fragmentation as well, in the sense that a lot of the stories that we tell that are actually part of the same story are somehow systematically told separately. And um, <clears throat> in, in, in that regard, a couple of weeks ago, when uh, Gurmina Bambra was doing her lecture here, I think she really highlighted this idea for the need for connected history. We need to reconnect things that actually go together. Again, not just to plus up or, or just make the story slightly more interesting, but once you start doing that, you just see that a lot of the way that um, we research and that we present things, they don't make sense at all. Uh, so you have the connected histories approach from uh, Guminda Bambra, for instance, but also the whole idea of coloniality slash modernity that is being uh, developed by uh, many decolonial thinkers like Quijano and Mignolo is the idea that we have our departments that somehow speak and write um, and teach about modernity, whether it's in economics or literature or any other studies. And then we have uh, somehow um, departments like ours, international development studies, where it's much more um, the flip side of the story. But if in all of these departments, we would always bring both sides of the stories together, trying to uh, make an understanding that this rise of modernity and enlightenment and all this uh, Western fabulousness could not have happened in the absence of uh, a coloniality at the same time. Again, the story is uh, fundamentally different. So it's about connecting, reconnecting origins of wealth and poverty systematically together. When we treat the issues of corruption, for instance, often when I ask my students, if you have to give me you know, some of the main ideas that come to mind of what's wrong with Africa today, often it's corruption. And again, corruption, I'm sure, I don't want to dismiss it as a, a problem, but corruption is somehow something that is presented or understood in a very fragment, fragmentized way, as in something that is only uh, located um, 
in the African context, right? Something that we can intervene in to try and teach them how not to be corrupt, but somehow there's a complete detachment of um, the fact that obviously you need multiple sites for corruption to, to be able to flourish uh, on the one hand. But like I said, this whole idea of studying our own involvements in isolation, mostly as the firefighters, uh, those with good intentions, even though at the same time, both in the past and in the present, we've been much more on the side of uh, those that has, have caused and continue to cause a lot of the ills. So the third one, um, after point of origin fragmentation, is this idea, obviously, of Eurocentrism. Um, and uh, thinkers like Chakrabarti have been calling for the need to provincialize uh, Europe. Um, calls also come for, for instance, deprovincializing other spaces uh, like Africa, as has been done by uh, thinkers like Sabelo uh, Lovu uh, Gatseni. And the idea there, obviously, most of you uh, know what it is about. Also, it's, I think, the challenge to think through the, the implications of, of these needs that goes beyond just also telling stories of these other spaces, but also trying to think, once we bring them in, what stands still from the way we um, understand the world. So decolonizing development would therefore entail an overall imperative to delink solidarity from the idea of Western incursion, however uh, defined. So if we try to apply this very briefly, and I'll, um, I'm sure I'll be able to come back to some of the points uh, in, in the Q&A, is um, if we try to think about this very concretely in terms of either research, pedagogy, education, and institutionally, um, what I was thinking about is that in terms of research, it's um, trying to think or revisit the assumption, um, assumptions of and the different myths that make out uh, our discipline. So if I think of my own research topic for my dissertation, it took me 12 years, so don't take me <laughs> at, at face value here. But um, was that I was very much interested in um, global solidarity, let's say, um, most specifically uh, humanitarian interventions being from Rwandan origin myself. I was very uh, taken by the fact that so many people could die and the international community didn't show up, right? So for a long time, my research was about how can we make sure that um, international institutions and Western actors do more um, as a response to this lack of ability to save human lives at the moment that it's most necessary. And it took me a long time, but one of the implications, I think, of engaging with decolonial uh, thought in this sense was somehow to, to be mindful of the fact that maybe we lack also a lot of studies, um, a lot of ways of studying Western absence and to what extent that can be productive uh, or not. And I don't know if that, if that makes it uh, very clear, but the few places, and so it brought me to study, for instance, the case of peace and state building in Somaliland where there had not been an international intervention. Um, a lot of these spaces do not get our attention in international development studies because some, and it's not, it's not consciously, but um, some of the implications there might be that there is a salience sometimes when there is not this type of incursion. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't do humanitarian interventions when people are actually dying, but from a research perspective, what are the implications from demythologizing some of our understandings of how the world works and how it is to the choices we make in terms of our research agenda. And so it ended up me trying to make sense of the concept of ethical retreat and what that would look like. Again, I don't have an answer yet, but I have my whole life to study that. So in terms of pedagogy, I think I already gave a lot of examples. Uh, there it will be in the classroom. How can we reconnect stories where we begin and also probably question or focus on the fact uh, focus on the fact that maybe we have uh, too much uh, attention for the technical or the technocratic. Also highlighting some systematic absences in development studies, and I think uh, more concretely of race and racism, that somehow seems to 
magically disappear once we uh, enter the international uh, sphere. Um, but also, what space is there for violences inflicted through the international encounter, whether it's colonial or differently uh, meant? Um, and also probably uh, where we locate the problems uh, and the solutions. Institutionally, delinking solidarity from aid and development business would, in my opinion, denaturalize the need for international development studies departments. They are not an absolute necessity to think about solidarity, global justice, reparations. And one could think also there, um, I think, all of us who are in a UK uh, context, they keep on changing our departments, putting them together, breaking them apart, shuffling people around, usually for reasons very far removed from anything to do with decolonial critical thinking. But in that context, there is maybe scope to try and rethink um, how we can put together our departments and disciplines in a different way. We can think also in the Q&A about what to do with placements Again, if we want to break through this idea of superiority and inferiority, how we manage to send our students in positions of authority and power when they are barely, um, I want to say barely born, that's not true, but um, you know, like very unexperienced, let's say, in positions of, of great um, responsibility in a global south where they ha get jobs and we actively encourage them that they would never get in a UK context. Those are some institutional things that really need to be addressed, not just as a side note, but I think um, very, very institutionally uh, and as a, as a matter of urgency, because at some point you get um, a, a really an almost normative clash between being very deconstructive and critical in the classroom and making them uh, aware of all the pitfalls of the development desire, but on the other hand, institutionally, we keep on offering that and taking their money for it as well. Um, and I think there is, there is a problem that, that we need to think about and you know, we also make our money uh, through that. And sometimes I've also been thinking about really the nitty gritty of admin life that we all hate. Uh, but just think of the insurance forms that we have to fill out when we go on field work or whatever and how different they are for going to the US or me going back home to Belgium or doing this dangerous trip somewhere in the global south. So, and it came to my attention because I had to fill them out to go to Rwanda, which is, you know, my second home. And they are so much thought of with a white Western scholar in mind that they are, they become, um, they somehow become blatantly racist and white supremacist once, once you realize how, how they've been conceived. And again, we use the word racist and white supremacist and often um, it, it it causes discomfort because we have an implied um, intentionality behind it. But I think, <clears throat> especially when we look at um, the administrative life, we don't even have to imagine some badly intended person drafting these forms. These forms just have their own logic. And I think a lot of the work also needs to go through there. Probably more importantly, it would be the work that needs to be done in how we evaluate ethics, ethics boards. What are the things? that we consider as ethical or not for people, again, to do uh, their research. And also there, sometimes the mere idea of having to shove um, a consent form under everybody's nose that we're supposed to interview, again, that is something that might hold or make sense in a very tiny particular context in this whole planet, but most other spaces not. And again, how open are we to reconsider this once we allow more people in? Hmm. Okay, I look at the time, I only have five minutes and I still have a lot to talk about, but I'll, <laughs> I'll try to speed it up a little bit. So the second strategy, and some of the things will come back so I don't have to repeat them. Like I said, we're uh, connected to epistemology and uh, the how question, and how uh, the silencing and the need to desilence, and how the silencing um, manifests itself and is somehow implicated in the continuation of uh, colonial knowledge production. And on the one hand, we have literally the silencing. The other would be a production of hierarchized binaries. And the third one would be somehow the absence or the lack of space for transcendental nonlinear temporalities, alternative cosmologies, and all the other things that somehow in 
our Cartesian uh, rational, uh, rationality um, understanding of the world have pushed uh, to the side. So in terms of silencing, I don't think I have to expand too much. Um, we have examples in post and decolonial literature that speak of um, the issue of epistemicide, for instance, um, as put forward by uh, De Souza Santos, both in the past and today. And I think that's a, a fruitful concept to try and think how much of our international development thinking and practice is actually engaging in epistemicide. Again, epistemicide sounds like a really violent word with a lot of intentions behind it. It isn't. It doesn't even need the intentions to kill systems of thought and practices. But um, a lot of it can actually be thought in that way, I think. And obviously, we have uh, the famous work by uh, Gayatri Spivak on uh, the subalterns and their ability to speak, which obviously speaks more to our ability to hear them. What are the implications there? So you have the literal silencing, but on the other hand, also obviously silencing through many different other ways. Overrepresentation, hypervisibility, simplification, vilification, delegitimizing of particular voices in a very systematic way. And I'll be happy to come back to some examples um, in, uh, in the Q&A. When it comes to the production of hierarchized binaries, it's you know, obviously, again, uh, something that most of you might be familiar with, representation of um, also the studying or the understanding of the world, uh, us versus them. And the biggest problem with that is, because I don't think that categories in and of themselves need to be violent, but it's because, especially in the development sector, those are uh, binaries that are imbued with a hierarchy. Um, you know, it's um, the capable versus the incapable, for instance, in the very, um, the very seemingly innocent word as of capacity building, for instance. I think a lot of what we study has to do with capacity building. It is imbued by a hierarchized uh, binary and also a, a, an equality amongst people that we might all embrace in theory, but that in development studies is being projected in the future, right? So somehow we uh, achieve an equality once we enter uh, a, a particular uh, framework. It's also the logic that allows for punishment and re rewards in the master-teacher relationship. Again, all of these things, all the, these critiques have already been part of uh, critical development thinking uh, for a long time. Question is, how do we bring them uh, to their both pedagogical research and institutional uh, implications? And so before I go uh, to that, the last bit of the silencing or the need to desilence is really to think more seriously about what space we give to um, these other forms of knowing, other knowledges. Um, and helpful concept there is the concept of pluriversality, uh, obviously, but also how much space do we give to embodiment, affect, the religious, and the mythological that I was speaking about uh, before. What are the implications when we take that seriously, when we don't just use them as, again, really interesting side notes to make our classes more exciting? I think the implications are very vast, and I'm not really sure I already have a whole sense of, of what that would be uh, or what that would look like. One thing that uh, I have found useful uh, in thinking in, that, in those terms uh, is a um, concept put forward by Robbie Shilliam in his book, The Black Pacific, on maybe the need for us to rethink knowledge production as knowledge cultivation, as let's say that all the sources of knowledge are somehow already there, but it's about recombining them in a different way, the way that you would plow land, for instance. You're not creating land out of thin air. Everything is already there, but you do something else with it. And especially in our um, very competitive, uh, output-oriented impact, uh, all these things, uh, frameworks of a context in which we are supposed to produce knowledge, this idea that it always has to be more and faster and more flashy than the person before, but also the competition that it creates in which we can only find our space by saying that we're saying something that somebody else hasn't said yet. I think, again, those are tiny things that are part of how we have to rethink what we are doing research-wise, um, obviously. So when it comes to the silencing at the pedagogical level, obviously all the ideas about the syllabus, how it looks like, who is in there, but mostly who is not in there, uh, it's a very important thing. 
and um, inviting the idea of unlearning into your classroom rather than learning. It's, I think it's something that for our students is challenging, but often maybe for ourselves even more challenging. Uh, because again, we got our title by pretending to be an expert in something. Uh, <laughs> and I laugh, but it is, it is, um, it's a process that is more discomforting than, than comforting. But um, also tiny things in the classroom, like how do we project the location of knowledge in, in a classroom, right? Like in this setup, for instance, um, you know, you, you give the, obviously the impression of this person in front is saying something that, that we don't know, so there's the hierarchy there. I'm not saying that we have to be naive and, and pretend that, you know, knowledge can be produced in this um, power-free Walhalla, whatever. We keep on being the people that uh, mark our students uh, and decide whether they get the degree or not. But I do think that there is scope for um, reversing um, their own understanding of their participation in the knowledge cultivation, right? So I think that idea of knowledge cultivation can be useful in class. And a very simplistic way in which I do it is, for instance, often um, start the class, especially in seminar context, by having everybody say something about the reading, rather, first of all, than to only um, build on those students that either think they have something interesting to say or are not shy at all uh, to speak, but somehow to, yeah, I guess, to open up the space in which uh, knowledge can be shared and created together but also to come out more often um, with the answer, I actually don't know. Uh, I don't, you know, so to also be in only when it's, when it's true. So I'm not gonna fake it, but just this idea of knowledge not being closed and finalized and finished. Again, how do we negotiate that in a university that asks for search for truth and certainties and measurable outcomes of knowledge and all these things? Um, I'm picking and choosing of the things that I want to say. I think in terms of research, obviously our own bibliographies, how do we put them together? Where do we locate theory, abstract thinking, conceptual work? Where do we do extraction? And I think that's very much important in uh, a lot of our research areas. But also, um, do we work through our discovery of self-reflexivity and positionality. Most of us might be already very critical in many of these things, but often it becomes an exercise of mentioning it and then continuing our research agenda as, as it was. And also, or it becomes something that is very self-referential and speaks more about ourselves than whatever we want to contribute to. I'm trying to think also what are some of the implications of being serious about our positionality and are we brave sometimes enough to refuse to be something like a country expert? Because just the idea of country expertise is, um, is highly problematic in and of itself. But yeah, what happens if we engage um, with actively closing down certain research areas for ourselves? Because we know that if you don't even speak the, the language of a country, there are limits in how much you can be, and either you, you, know, you learn it or you invest it, you stay there. Those, there are many different uh, ways of thinking it, but what, what I just wanted to highlight was this idea that we cannot just flag up positionality and self-reflexivity and not um, work through the consequences of that potentially self-referential uh, activity. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna move to, do I have two more minutes? Two more minutes, okay. <laughs> to the last strategy, which I've always find the most difficult to really put my finger on, but it's somehow to have a sense that it can, um, to somehow as a call to, um, again, have the guts to detach or delink our research, but also our teaching from um, this ideal of objective knowledge production and somehow embracing or realizing that all types of knowledge at any moment in time always have been produced to serve certain causes, right? And I think anthropology, probably also development studies, many of our disciplines, we can even locate or retrace their colonial, literal colonial origins. They were needed to get knowledge about certain places to do certain things. It doesn't mean that there is no way out for us from these things, but uh, I think there has been a move towards Let's, not, let's just not talk about it and have our benchmarks of how we do good research 
as far as, we, as possible removed from the idea of a normative investments. And again, maybe I'm, I'm generalizing and it goes more for some approaches, more the positivist approach or not. I think my, my, my point here would be that a decolonial approach would really somehow call for a re-embracing of the fact that there is no such thing as knowledge that can be produced in a power vacuum uh, or not serving one uh, or the other uh, status quo or uh, the change. So the question is, um, to what extent can we produce knowledge that is not necessarily at the service of this will to power? And I think in the development sector, there is a big will to power, even though it is quoted in good intentions and uh, the betterment of other societies, but it's the will to power somehow that that defines a lot of uh, what is there. And it's here that lies the idea, or this is in line with the idea of solidarity and justice, and where, you know, this idea of the baby pops up uh, again. And I think it's by answering the normative questions of what we're doing, and not just having them at the immaterial level, but also at the material one, that we go back to the proclaimed idea and the goals of what development was supposed to be uh, about. Um, and so some of the questions there is about thinking against the idea of there is no alternative. Um, in development thinking, even though there have been a lot of shifts, but somehow the baseline continues to be a linear progress towards um, an imaginary better future. And too often it's still linked very much to ideas of market capitalist global system or liberal market democracy. And how do we embrace that that is not the only way forward beyond just only deconstructing it, okay? So how can we, within um, this global justice solidarity thinking and studies, uh, develop more strands of research that somehow allows us to, to constructively contribute to those ideas. It will also involve uh, a need to move beyond just uh, talking back. And we think of what our <coughs> benchmarks are. And I, th I would say there again, maybe we've moved too much towards the technocratic understanding um, of the benchmarks and somehow reframe our understandings of outcomes and accountability and where do we locate the power of the people to decide which ones uh, they are. And a shortcut to all that would obviously be to think about aid um, rather in terms of reparation than um, as aid. It's a tiny example that somehow shows that the call to materially and immaterially decolonize development studies has to be about a shift in power. It cannot just be about, and that power can go in terms of research agendas, pedagogy and institutions. So it's not just about plussing up or talking back, but it's about uh, somehow finding an opening, courage and willingness to, to embody that shift in power and not just talk about it or teach about it or write uh, about it. And like I said, I don't have uh, all the answers. And I think I'll uh, leave it at that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Olivia, for that wide-ranging talk, uh, bringing in pedagogy, research, power at the end, uh, mm. transformation, all sorts of very interesting and fascinating issues to discuss. So the floor is open for that, um, which means that We'll, will you take questions and we'll have a discussion? Would that yeah, be? Yeah, we okay. Can. So um, could I maybe have uh, some questions from students in the room first? So the priority to people who are studying rather than people who are, well, wasting their time, like me. <laughs> Sorry, I realized there would be a microphone involved. Um. Yeah, the whole world is missing. <laughs> Um, maybe this is a bit more of a personal question, but I feel like um, these conversations are necessary and important. They're also draining and exhausting to have after a long time. And I find that not all of the spaces are as open as IDS to having them. Mm. And especially once you go out into the real world and start working. Um, 
they're even harder to have them happen. Um, so as someone who's been working in, who's been working and studying these issues for a long time, um, how do you, I guess, maintain the stamina to, <laughs> to continue to have these discussions? Often I find that they fall to the wayside, partly because, um, partly because uh, there's not enough space for them, but also partly because people run out of steam. Mm -hmm. I'll take some more. Yeah. yeah, great. So could we have a few questions, and we'll, and we'll let Olivia respond, and then we'll have a few more after that. Anybody else in the room has a... Hi. Um, thanks a lot for the, for the talk. Um, I think this kind of discussions are really, really useful, and also uh, to try to really deconstruct the discourse on development is really fundamental. But if one was to apply this to, let's say, a specific issue and try to um, engage with the public, and if I think about the EU, for example, nowadays, with the current um, refugee crisis that is going on, how would you practically um, implement a strategy to decolonize sort of the discussion yeah. on, on such a topic, for example? Yeah, thank you. Um, another one from another student. Well, I, I'm, I'm thinking now in terms of the decolonization of the mind mm. of the people who receive mm -hmm. this foreign aid, so that perhaps it works better for them. Mm -hmm. You know, because at the moment it's not like that. It doesn't work. It doesn't it doesn't benefit. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm coming from that side of mm -hmm. the, the world where, you know, I, I see these things happening. Also, these discussions are not really there on the ground. Mm -hmm. People are still colonized, mentally mm -hmm. speaking. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to check from you, how do you think about this? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, any, shall we take one more? Uh, last question before we let you live here? Please. I have two questions. The first one is, um, it's kind of silly, but are you suggesting that um, I, or like, if I eventually when I start working, that I shouldn't do development work in a place that I don't belong to? Mm -hmm. um, is that a takeaway? Second, then you talked about how, um, although we talk about decolonizing and we have centered discourse in institutions, eventually we end up working in an in a complete professional framework that still um, runs on this fuel. Um, do you have any suggestions or do you have any strategy of how do you decolonize not just the um, institution but also the industry? How do we mm -hmm. um, uh, counter that gap? Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Olivia, the floor is again yours. <laughs> and then we come back for more questions, yes? Yeah? So it's about how much time do we have? Half an hour? Half an hour, yeah. Ah, good. Thank you. Uh, question time is always most exciting. I find. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, question about stamina. It's a, it's a good one. Um, yeah, it might it might sound a bit. Um, no, let's put it like this: the way that I try to address it to myself sometimes, and I'm not always up, but, you know, like uh, as everyone. Um, a, a thought that helps me is the idea that it's not about us or me as an individual. Um, it's going to sound a bit esoteric, whatever, but you know, we're just like different little uh, clocks in, in a machine that can go many different ways, right? So, especially when you get, and that's also why I wanted to bring in the alt right and all these movements towards super right. It's true, this maybe can be even. Um, the little Walhalla are nice environments where we feel free to talk about it, but it's first of all not just about these critical spaces on the country. Whenever people go to the to vote, we see how marginal we are. <laughs> um, so it helps if you if you can remind yourself why you're doing it while you realize that it's not about you. But obviously, at the micro level, it's about finding ways to be surrounded by 
both like-minded people in, with whom you can work in solidarity, but also it helps when you can surround yourself by people that you love that might be completely on the other end of this discussion. And I think that's where sometimes it becomes very draining because there's a lot of silos in society. And it's difficult to imagine even that somebody who has completely different opinions from you, we forget how to be without agreeing. It's a bit vague as answer, but somehow <laughs> that's how I try um, to, to go about it. And also, I guess um, it is somehow exciting if you... The most draining about university life or research life, I think, is also monotony or the fact that everything needs to be measurable and, and quantity and all these things. But if you somehow find a space in which you feel that you are doing something important, even if it's super tiny, it's not about the flashy things... Uh, for me, it's about redesigning a unit and, you know, with a lot of trepidation going and see my students every week, but see that the thinking changes together. It's, I'm still, like, physically completely drained, but mentally it's something that, that somehow can give you, um, I think, energy in, in the long run. But, yeah, the ID, so whenever you get, like, racist or other pushbacks, the mantra in my head, it's not about you, keep going, something like that. Um, the question about um, a concrete example to apply to the refugee crisis, um, and I'm happy you ask it because it makes it slightly more concrete. That's also how I try to think through it for myself, but also uh, in class. So it's a good example also to, to show that thinking about decoloniality is always in a particular context. So if you teach the EU refugee crisis in Europe, for instance, not just teach, but even as a journalist, if you had to make choices in how to... Um, steer the debate or as a politician where you start thinking um, in terms of, of uh, the mythology and uh, the point of origin the Eurocentrism in it um, and the fragmentation one could say that the refugee crisis becomes in a European context first of all a story of exceptionality and this flooding of people coming in once you break through that Eurocentrism you start even counting you just know that we get a tiny percentage of all the people on the move on this planet. So that's a tiny uh, example. The other is where do we start the story? Often the analysis only starts when people start knocking at Fortress Europe and are not allowed in uh, or out. So systematically connecting the reasons for moving to our own involvements in all different ways is, is another way. But I would say even further in time, if you have to reconnect our histories... Even the most well-intended discussions about um, the refugee crisis seem to be framed in, in languages of uh, the gift of being generous or not. And that is a, a way of thinking that you can only have if you systematically consider the others as outsiders that don't have any, necessarily anything to do with your society and then in the goodness of your heart you're going to let them in or not. If you apply a decolonial understanding of that and you actually connect the fact that Basically, most of our uh, wealth has not been able to come to be without connections beforehand, and so the co-construction of this world, you can push in the longer term for a, a re rethinking of this whole idea, obviously, of, of um, citizenship in and out people, and the whole idea of the gift is... You, you start to understand how inadequate it is, actually, to try and understand how we're going to inhabit uh, this world... And the last one I would add to that is, is very much this idea, what is being naturalized in this story? What is naturalized is the fact that the state system with its borders is naturalized. And I think the refugee story is, is um, a moment for us to realize that people are not necessarily dying because they don't have money to get here or to buy a plane ticket. It's often much cheaper than you know, than to, uh, to pay smugglers. People are dying because they're not allowed in, because they don't have the right papers. So, so it's the naturalization of borders in the whole state system that is killing people, and not just any people, it's racialized people as well. If it would happen to Europeans, the whole story would be completely different as well in two seconds. So um, just, just to give, give an idea that it's not just about deconstructing or reframing some of the arguments, but I think a decolonial lens really can help us to, to think through what we find natural and normal and get rid of that. So it's, um, and I think the borders, 
in the story of the refugee crisis is something we do not talk about sufficiently. And I understand it's not, you know, um, Sky News or Ch uh, Channel 4, whatever, that will repeatedly uh, bring this on the evening news. But I think at least in terms of editorial boards, researchers ourselves, but even how we teach it in school. And so it might be that it's not happening immediately, but it's really about denaturalizing the thing that kills people, to put it very simplistically, rather than get, getting stuck in how can we be slightly more generous than, than we have been previously, I would say. I don't know if that, that helps us. Uh, um, the receiving end of, um, you know, the questions of decolonization of the mind in, let's say, non-Western context uh, in, in this. Uh, it's also why I have for granted that my talk uh, was very much located in this space and myself as um, a, a European subject at this point, but not just that. And I think, so on the one hand, my cop that answer would be, I do not necessarily think um, for Western scholars in general to take the forefront in explaining how people, uh, previously colonized people, whatever, should go about that decolonization. Having said that, given that I am also Rwandan and have a lot of discussions with my Rwandan colleagues or friends or family members, the, one of the first thing is that it made me realize that the decoloniality discussion has to be a very specific one. So there are other priorities uh, that come up. You don't get away as easily as saying, oh, we shouldn't all be embracing capitalist market, uh, progressive thinking, whatever, when you ha there is a, a different position from which you, you say this. So when I say, when we're thinking about degrowth and all these things, in a lot of um, um, spaces, the, the access to material goods is something that is being experienced at a different level of urgency than I can do from my plushy, whatever, uh, UK position at this moment. Having said that, though, I do think that the urgency is at least as big uh, on the African continent. I just think that I don't always feel 100% comfortable to be very prescriptive in those conversations, and I do in, in micro sense. But, so I would say that the, um, the imperatives are the same. The way that people give um, voice to them might be different. But I would not necessarily agree that maybe the distinction between um, people in general and then the academics that engage with this, we have exactly the same problem in Western Europe in the sense that the majority of people is not convinced or dealing with this idea that you know their minds need to be decolonized. And so in very concrete terms, I would say decolonization of the mind in an African context would be very much, uh, have very much to do with getting rid of the desire to be like the white man, whatever that might mean. And however, whereas decolonization of the mind in the West would be very much um, to move away from the myths of the superiority of the white man. But it's, so it's part of the same story, but it's leading actors need not be the same. And I think for me, saying that decolonization is a very contextual something, I think people have first and foremost uh, the responsibility to the places where they are. And where they're tied to in a way where you have a different variety of investments, some of them where you cannot escape them, so, and some of them that you've chosen somehow. And it ties into the question, the last question, that was asked about whether you, you're not allowed to work in a place where you're not from. <laughs> um, again, it's a question that is contextual, and I'm gonna sound like a cop-out again, but the reason why I said that I start from um, a Western perspective in the way that I'm doing these critiques is because it is a pushback to uh, an over-representation 
of European descendants in European or Western or whatever. And that does not always have to be embodied by a white body, because if tomorrow I go to any random country to do development work, a lot of my being will be representing this Western uh, being. Is um, in that in this moment in time there is an overrepresentation of uh, Western actors in that. And I would, uh, on a personal note, the way that you answer this is, um, I mean, in my ideal world, the world is everybody's, and you know, people should be able to go anywhere. So it's not about closing doors necessarily, but it's about critically engaging with what position you're taking that might be better done by a person that is not necessarily physically 100% from there, but has an investment in a place that is very different from the hyper um, mobile development elites that many of us are part of. Because if one day we're bored of a place, we really have the freedom to go somewhere else. I'm not saying that that is wrong in and of itself, but there's an overrepresentation of these type of um, identities that have way too much power in the whole development construct. Um, and so even if it's not just about development per se, but for instance, I do, part of my research is on a very tiny aspect of something in Rwanda, and I refuse to call myself a Rwanda expert. I don't speak King Rwanda, right? And sometimes it really means that when you're being called by the BBC, because there have been elections uh, in Rwanda, and, you know, they also have their quota system, so it's really cool for them to be able to have uh, a random person answering the very uh, stereotypical questions we always get about any election in any African country. It's um, having, having the, the presence of mind to, to refuse. For instance, when not because I won't be happy with the questions, which I won't be, but also because knowing, for instance, I haven't been following the elections for a long time, let's say, um, I haven't talked about it with anybody. It's not my field of study. And I could take three hours and really study quickly, whatever, and then make a name. And so for me, it's to say I'm, I'm stepping away from that space because I'm not the person to talk about it. That, I think that's what I meant. And it's, you know, in a much more micro way, uh, an answer uh, to your question as well. And then finally, the question about the industry, sorry. Um, I think my point tonight was that the, the thinking and the researching and the university and the industry and the continuation of the industry are very much intertwined. So in a university space, that's why I would be advocating for, f yeah, for, for at least starting the conversation about the abolishment of international development studies as a field of study or as a degree that you offer because it opens a career path towards the industry or towards, right? So if you can't, you know, you can't have students keep on paying for a degree that at the end of it, they only feel depressed because they've been told that it's the wrong thing. So if you wanna be, yeah, if you wanna think through the implications of the fact that it is, that we identified as a deeply colonial system, then I do think, and that is linked to the, either the continuation or the radical overhaul of some of, of the industries as well. So I would say that it's part of, of the same system. Okay, well, thank you Vitya, for, uh, <laughs> for a extent, uh, very good response to the questions. Now, we have space for about 15 more minutes and a few more questions. So if you could, if any, there are any, please come up with questions, but keep them brief if possible. Uh, and and then, I'll try to uh, be brief as well. <laughs> thank you, Olivia. That was most interesting. While you've been talking... <coughs> I've been thinking about another model of development which has no colonial taint. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure they don't study development studies at university. Um, they are absolutely honest about what they want out of development. And on the whole, I think they do a good job. And that is the Chinese model. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested to know what you think of that. Okay. Thank you. There's one question there, and then uh, I'll tear back there. 
Okay. I, I actually have like a myriad of questions, but of course I can't <laughs> ask all of them. So I'll go with a simple one because we don't have much time. It's basically uh, going back to the refugees um, crisis. Is like when a person tells you, well, I don't feel responsible because it was not me going there and colonizing. Uh, so mm. why should I feel responsible now and just let people in? Like, what is your response to this kind of um, yeah. position? Well, thank you. Um, Pierre? It's just a short question. So I think it's interesting you mentioned Fanon and concerning violence at the beginning of the talk. And you know, one of the things that Fanon stresses is the need to have a kind of violent or like a, a real disruption from the colonial experience to, to move forward into yeah. anything else. And I, sometimes I, it would be good to hear your comments because sometimes I feel like you know, the development is coloniality, as you know, you've said many different ways and times tonight. And it's, people are so invested in it, in educational institutions, in the development architecture, you know, amongst our students, this idea of themselves as you know, being altruistic and what the development industry does. So I wonder, you know, do you think then that there needs to be, like, it, it can't be a, a kind of a gradual thing, like there needs to be, not like physically, like direct violence as such, but like a, a real disruption um, and a real naming of these like, ideas and perceptions of others to, to then really move forward, and that is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of talked about this before, you know, but I mean, perhaps this is necessary as well. <coughs> Any other questions? Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I guess adding to your analogy, this, if I understood it correctly, this idea of also if we're trying to purify bath water or, you know, kind of... Um, eradicate these systems that aren't are actually maybe causing more problems. We also need to be prepared with water that's already purified and we need structures already that when we see the deconstruction of something to see the integration of you know something that will replace it and so I'm just trying to think in my own head like your your thoughts on this idea of the pace that this has to happen when I when I think about this analogy also, when you see the demolition of a building, for example, you need to be ready to, to build a new one almost immediately. Um, and so I'm just trying to think your, you know, your thoughts of like this idea of pace of the, that this process has to take. Could I ask a related question in terms of babies? And I've been wondering, you know, every, everybody's got their own baby they want to keep. So what about that? I mean, how would you keep all the babies and these babies might be fighting with each other? You know what I mean? Like they would be not an alignment between the babies you want to keep. So how do you keep babies who are constantly punching each other? <laughs> the questions become more and more violent. <laughs> 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 uh, um, so we have the Chinese model. People saying it wasn't me, so I shouldn't. Um, be uh, called upon uh, this, and then the violence disruption, the pace question also comes with it, and then the idea that the solidarity baby is not the only kid on the block, that's basically what you're saying. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think in terms of the Chinese model, um, first of all, I'm not an expert in it, but obviously it pops up, yeah, yeah, it pops up, but um, if, we, if we want to bring it in, I think the first question we need to ask ourselves is, do we bring it in as this potential other water or you know, other way of... Um, and I think that the Chinese model can be judged um, on its own merits, like you say, even outside the development context, but not always, right? Especially the way we teach it, whenever we bring in... We have one essay question for the first years is like the positive and the negatives of the new donors. And then you get all these uh, ideas about the Chinese and taking yeah. over and they're doing recolonization and whatever. I, I guess we have to be more, more specific there because there are continuities, but there are also differences. The only thing being, not the only thing, but let's say that the linear market, even if it's more state-driven desire for... Um, Economic, I think economic growth is still very central. Uh, extraction, exploitation is also very central. Those are things that we can discuss even outside the, the north-south north development uh, context. But at the same time, while we're doing it, let's say in the slowest part of our pace, 
I would incite students to be more serious about if they want to invoke the Chinese model to actually study it and not just only do it from the perspective we're getting nervous that there are new people around that somehow do not give conditions. Imagine that. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot to be said and most, much more should be centered on uh, how the Chinese are being received on the receiving end. And even there you see opinions that go from many different sides. Um, but yeah, if we need to do an exercise to break away from our own Eurocentric uh, imaginaries, it is, but I would say that it's not a radically enough different model in terms of how they behave internationally. But at least it gives you the idea that, yeah, the world does not start and end with the West. So in that sense, I think there is a, a productive something there. Um, in terms of, I wasn't the one colonizing, nor my people, nor, eh? uh, it's often something we might hear, let's say, in, uh, I think in Europe, it's mostly the Scandinavians that get away with it, but not really. But, you know, that, <laughs> that would bring it up or some, yeah. Um, I would, one of the productive ways to think about this is that it's not about just having a blame game conversation. So when you interpret it as connected histories in the sense of literally the building of the West and all the goods that are there has been done together, even without formal colonization or not, but just even the industrial revolution, the connections between the different European countries within, like none, none of Europe has been outside that colonial system of modernity, coloniality. It does not require people to blame or not to blame. It's just the fact that it wouldn't have happened if it was in isolation. So that's, I think that's the biggest clash uh, within Eurocentric thinking is that we are being told the story of a European isolated rise to magnificence somehow. I'm exaggerating. And that, that, so that's the part of the story that doesn't hold. So for me, one of the ways that I do often you know, try to engage with, with those conversations is that once you understand that, and that it's not just about you feeling ba bad, but is that your reflex to think, should I let them in or not, is a moot point. You're not letting them in. And I mean, I know physically, so I, I'm not being naive about the fact that we're getting these ideas that Europe is too small and all these people coming in and everything. But those, again, those are ideas that are very easily debunked if you already shift which people you consider in or out. So in, in our discussions about uh, freedom, you know, and that's changing for the UK, unfortunately, but you know, the free circulation of people and goods and all these things, in that context where suddenly imaginary, we all were the European Union and all these people within that framework, once you somehow assign the citizenship to this whole realm of people, then it's not necessarily about letting them in or out. Then we were all celebrating circulation and seeing how that would bring. Obviously, it's not a good example to give in the UK, but you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm from Belgium where everybody's celebrating these ideas. But um, so there is, I think there is a, a fundamental shift that happens if you change the terms of the conversation, which means that some of the objections, like, why should I let them in, don't hold anymore. But yeah how to frame that in a conversation in a, pub, in a much more accessible way, I don't know. But it's about, I think one of the ways that I often try to do is to take away the whole blame game thing, because people tend to stop listening once you make them feel guilty about something. But yeah, not to say that there isn't any guilt or whatever, but that's not the most productive way in this moment to have that conversation, I think. But then moving on to the final violence um, and the need for disruption, <clears throat> Um, I actually don't think that we can have successful decolonization of development within the, the university as it exists today. So, I mean, <laughs> the real disrupting thing would be like, let's blow up the university, whatever. But, you know, just like embrace, <laughs> embracing that idea of the impossibility, then the next question, obviously, a link to the question of pace is what do we do? Um, and for me, I think that's why I hold on to be explicit about our need to get rid of our develop departments of international development. Um, 
because having to have that conversation in and of itself, and then however we do it, whatever, that's part of a disruption. Everything that we keep in, in that sense would be much more the gradual. And we've been doing, this, I mean, it's disheartening how much efforts over the different decades, before we were born even, people have been engaging in this conversation. There's nothing new about it. So I think trying to somehow answer this call of the need for disruption, um, barring physical violence, because I don't think that's productive or, or useful here, it's to go and point at the comfort zones that we have ourselves. And when I say we need to um, think of abolishing those degrees, you know what type of conversations you will need to have with the powers to be, because also it attracts a lot of students. And I'm not saying these things to be cynical, it's just to explain how they continue and the logic behind it. Um, I don't know how optimistic I am of having these conversations for real, and it doesn't mean that when we create or integrate in other disciplines or other departments, the same might not happen. But for me, it's very much this idea that if development, international development studies is a continuation of a colonial system of governance, it, can, it, cannot, it cannot exist, or it cannot be celebrated institutionally and be a, a money generator at the same time of us wanting to do these things. So that's where I would locate very tinily this, uh, this need for disruption. And I guess that the pace um, is somehow located somewhere uh, in there as well. I do think by, for instance, uh, highlighting this idea of already changing the label aid, what would happen if you change aid for uh, reparations? You know, you have a, um, we don't have to invent these, these um, research agendas. They're already there. Global justice, um, international solidarity. A lot of these things are already there. So it's about the, f the framework there. And again, that it seems like a meek pace. And I also think that a lot of the revolutionary thinking is already being done and teaching within the different departments that exist, development departments or not. I'm just saying that to answer the question of how come we still have the industry and we continue to do it. Part of it is, is the fact that we have the institutional attachment. And then the different babies on, uh, <laughs> on the blog. I do think that if we are able to be a baby that is clearly invested in uh, international interconnectivity, um, solidarity, reparations, and global justice, we would have a much more solid ground in having conversations or fight whatever you want to do with all the other babies. What is happening now is that we're trying to do an anti or decolonial thing while we, are, while we are completely connected with this other, you know, so if we say the, ba the baby of international trade, for instance, or, you know, I think that's what you were pointing at. We are so, yeah. Yeah, what I was trying to say was that you can, you can, you can align some babies with each other and the, all the babies get together and they all go and exploit, let's say, some natural resources or some forest mm. resources somewhere else. But then some babies might say, look, okay, look, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah? And then some babies, of course, with lots of powerful economic interests behind them might still want to do that. Mm -hmm. So the, what I'm talking about is what happens when uh, even international solidarities, international solidarities for exploitation versus international solidarities for justice. Ecological justice. Yeah, yeah. So what happens when those kinds of uh, things arise? Because obviously capitalism is not restricted to one country. There is international solidarities within capitalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, make, which, which sustain it. Yeah, well, I would, the, the, the label, but it's not that the labels, but you know, a label like um, the colonial global justice, for instance, you can't really put all the other types of solidarity in there, right? So obviously no, we'll have to be no. specific, but I see what you mean. So you uh, have to exclude some. Yeah, 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 I'm not making the baby of the whole, that's the whole thing, it's, well, not, it's not about it. Well, some people will have to throw their babies out then with the bathwater. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, sorry about that, <laughs> throwing babies out. With <laughs> not a good way to end the talk. Uh, but thank you very much for coming, um, and thank you thank especially you. to Olivia for <laughs> no, coming here. And, uh, and I do want to say that there'll be a next series of Sussex Development Lectures next year, next term, I think.